everyone is unique, everyone is different. Diets have never worked, and they will never work. If I told you right now, there is no doctor in the world, there is no nutritionist, there is no healer, there is no spiritual leader in this world who heals you. We first got on a call with him. You know, Shamal recommended our mutual friend. He's been a speaker before. Uh, he connected both of us, and we got on a call. It was on the weekend in a 15-minute slot, and I asked him, what was the 15-minute slot, uh, slot about? He said, yeah, I just have a 15-minute break uh, in between seeing patients. Right? And he said, yeah, I, I see patients all the time, and uh, sometimes over the weekend also. It's just something I love to do. And he's here also, despite his uh, personal emergency back home, because he just has this giving, loving spirit. He's just always giving the best that he can. I've seen that online. He has over 400,000 followers on Instagram. A truly, truly remarkable teacher. And he's only here out of his spirit for giving to this tribe. So please, please give him a huge, huge, huge round of applause. And let's welcome Luke. Louder. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here. Let's get straight into it. How many of you on a diet? Put your hands up right now. A few hands now. At the end of the session, most people will come and ask diet-related questions. So this isn't the answer, but let me start off right now. What you're going to hear over the next one hour and the time that we're together is not about diets, because diets do not work, period. Diets have never worked and they will never work. And everything I say to you is today backed on science, and where science has its limitations, it is based on experience. I calculate every hour that I consult with patients over the years. Why? Because it's my time. That time could go towards my hobbies, my family, but that time is valuable. Every hour that you have, every minute that you have, goes by, you're never gonna get it back. You can lose money in the stock markets. Your business can do up and down. You can buy products, lose them, have material things. They could be stolen from you. You can get all of them back. But you can never get the time that has gone by back ever, which makes time the most priceless commodity on this planet. You want to be aware of where your time goes. And when I say this, people say, Luke, I want to flow with life. Flowing with life still means you need to know where your time goes. What we're going to talk about today are four pillars of health. I specialize in integrative oncology, so we work with cancer patients. Everything I speak today is based on a benchmark of the human body. Some of you may have conditions, some of you may be absolutely healthy in the physical body, but struggling with the emotional mind. Some of you may be awakened emotionally, but struggling with the physical body. How do we bring the connection? Because there are five spheres of the human body. There is the emotional self, the physical self, the mental self, the spiritual self, and the intellectual self. How do you grow in each of these a little every day? Some people want to build great bodies, and they put all the energy only into the physical self. Do that if that's your goal. But don't forget the other four spheres if you want to evolve holistically. Today what I'm talking about are four pillars. The first is balanced nutrition. Note that I use the word balanced. We are all products of nature. Nature works on the principle of balance. We need to find a balance that works for us. Why is health failing, not just in India, but across the world? Three diseases that lead the United States, India, the UK, Australia, and a lot of the Far East and the Middle East. The number one disease, anyone? Diabetes. Diabetes. Number two? Diabetes. Cardiovascular, and the third is cancer, but it's not a competition. Cancer and cardiovascular are fighting for that second position together. It's a huge problem. While a lot of us look at that in fear, I advise you to step back and see what's going wrong. 
when we have beautiful events like this that teach us to emotionally connect with ourselves. We have nutritionists, we have doctors, we have functional medicine experts, we have yoga therapists, we have super specialized surgeons and doctors, we have supplements, we have whey proteins, we have everything for great health. Do the numbers now make sense to you? What's going wrong? Why is health deteriorating? Why is emotional health deteriorating? And when you step back and you realize how fast life is moving, and today when I tell you slow down, I don't mean slow down that you've got to stop doing things. It means you've got to step back and reevaluate every decision that you make when it comes to your health, your relationships, your family, your loved ones, your work, and what your purpose is. Most people are in the rat race. I at least say, be a healthy rat, because you're either going to win or you're going to lose. Do we have to be part of the rat race? Be it. I'm part of the rat race too. I'm a rat. I'm running all the time, but I'm not competing. I'm not competing. There is no requirement to compete. So you can be a healthy rat. Let's move straight into the first vertical, which is nutrition. The second one is adequate exercise or movement, because the word exercise turns off a lot of people. So I'll use the word movement. Adequate. Note that I use the word adequate because there are too many people overtraining, overstretching, overdoing it, and there are people underdoing it. Adequate. Then we move into sleep, the most powerful drug on this planet. Whether you want to call it deep sleep, restorative sleep, meditative sleep, we're going to talk about that. Each of you will walk out of here knowing the importance of sleep, and then you're left with an option to choose what you want to do. It's not going to make your life boring, I can promise you that. When you choose to live holistically, it doesn't mean. Most people say, Luke, I don't want to give up potting. I don't want to give up. Who said you need to give it up? You can have all of it. Balance. And the last vertical is emotional health. I've kept that the last because it's the most important. The most important. Everyone would think nutrition is the most important thing. Nutrition is overhyped. It's overhyped. Nutrition is simple. We're going to learn about that. There are two villages in the Amazon. Both these villages are separated by about 10 kilometers of land. An eagle flies into the first village. The natives see the eagle as an omen of death and suffering. They burn the settlement and they move down the Amazon to find new land. 10 kilometers down, the second village, an eagle flies into that village. The natives see it as good luck. They decide this is the land where we've got to cultivate our crops and live. They have a ceremony and they celebrate. The same kind of people, the same bird, but two completely different mindsets. Why am I telling you the story? Because as I speak today, there are millions of people across the world who still believe fourth stage cancer equals death. There are millions of people who don't believe type 2 diabetes can be reversed as we speak. There are millions of people reversing it. There are millions of people living with thyroid because they believe, my doctor said, it's a lifetime disease. But then how is it that millions of people are reversing their thyroid? There are millions of people who are healing what science cannot explain. The number's not small. So in medicine, you write off small miracles as we don't understand it. Just keep it there. Don't talk about it. But when the numbers are in millions, What's the difference? Everyone in this room right now has a different mindset when it comes to nutrition, when it comes to love, when it comes to sex, when it comes to physical belonging, when it comes to meditation, when it comes to dance. If I ask questions, I'll get different answers from everyone, and that's okay. Why? Who you are, your upbringing, your childhood, the environment you grew up in, the friends you hung around with, the social media content that you absorb, the books that you read, the movies that you watch, are constantly forming your mindset. It's not a bad thing until it becomes limiting for you. It becomes, it becomes a limiting pattern that doesn't allow you to believe beyond. If I told you right now, there is no doctor in the world, there is no nutritionist, there is no healer, there is no spiritual leader in this world who heals you. Only your body can heal you. All of these people and experts can enable, they can empower you, they can put you on the path, they can give you expertise. But never ever forget that it is only your body that can heal you, period. Nothing else. The medicine can, ha can hit the symptom. 
Our patients going through chemotherapy as I speak today, it's treating the cancer symptomatically. But what's going to bring about the healing? The body's own immune system, the human body. What Western medicine has done, and now sadly Indian medicine is doing, they've separated the mind from the physical self. You're like a car. You have a kidney problem, you only look at the kidney. You have a heart problem, you only look at the heart. But when you have diabetes, you've got to look at the heart, you've got to look at the kidney, you've got to look at everything together if you want to solve the problem. You get to the root cause of the problem. That's all related to a relationship, because everyone has had some up or down in their relationships. It doesn't have to be with your partner. It could be with your parents, your siblings, your colleagues, your boss, everyone. You can keep on trying to put band-aids in your relationship, and there'll be good days and there'll be bad days. Or you can choose to address the root cause of the problem for once and make your decision. Let's come straight into nutrition. If you think I'm going to be talking about A2 milk today and A1 milk and whether vegan is better than non-vegetarian, absolutely not. We're going deeper. And I'll tell you why we're going deeper. It's not because it's not important to me. I respect all vegans, non-vegetarians. Be whoever you want to be. But what do the numbers talk? I have equally cancerous vegans, non-vegetarians, pescas, pegans, you name it. Equal. There is no scientific data at all yet showing us. Of course, a cardiovascular patient with inflammation in the heart will definitely benefit from a plant-based diet until inflammation comes down. There are specific choices to be made, but we're going deeper today. How many people drink milk and don't have a problem? How many of people have made a problem with milk even though it suits them? It's individualistic, which brings me to my next point, the beauty of biometrics. Why does biometrics work? Biometrics works on the principle of uniqueness. There are no two similar fingerprints, even in identical twins. What does this teach us? Everyone is unique. What someone else eats doesn't have to suit you or give you the same goals as someone else. If someone meditates for one hour, it doesn't have to bring you the same peace or mindfulness or clarity as someone who meditates for maybe 15 minutes and finds their clarity and peace. Remember uniqueness every time you try to copy a diet, copy a lifestyle, imitate a workout. Blindly, we can learn. We have a whole ecosystem out there of information and knowledge, which we can absorb. But finally, we have to make the decision, what suits me? There are diet fads. There are spiritual fads. Spirituality has also become a big fad. Everyone only talks the books, preaches the books, but no one wants to put it into action. Most people don't want to try to implement what they learn. Coming back to nutrition, the most powerful physician lives within you, and that is fasting. No, no, no. Don't, don't get worried about fasting. I'm not talking about 18, 24 hours, everything that the Internet's put in your mind. Fasting again, remember biometrics. I have patients who get the most beautiful results in 12 hours of fasting. I have some who get it in 18, some in 15, some in 14, some in three days. Everyone is different. Why is fasting so powerful? It's a mechanism that is built in us. We're born with it. We are born with it. But everyone eats all the time. There are snacks improper meal timings, and all of these things that create the first problem. It doesn't matter whether you're having chia seeds, pumpkin seeds, garlic, turmeric. That's important. But it doesn't matter if your digestive system isn't obeying the bio-circadian rhythm of the human body. Let me give you an example. There is something called the MMC. In Mumbai, we have the BMC. What's the job of the BMC? Which they don't do very well. The MMC is your motor migratory complex. It's the housekeeping system of the digestive system. Now picture this. When you eat a meal, all of you had breakfast. Within about 90 to 120 minutes, the MMC gets activated. What's the job of the MMC? Imagine a broom sweeping all the toxins, the broken down food, the bacteria, down your small intestine into your colon to prepare for your next bowel movement, which could be 12 hours or 24 hours later. What stops the MMC from working if I'm constantly eating? If it gets activated at a particular time, I've not even finished digesting my breakfast and I'm ready for my cookie and my coffee, or I'm ready for my lunch, 
I take away some intelligence of the human body, which is designed to work for us, to remove the waste, the toxins, the acidic bits of food, the bad bacteria. That's the intelligence in the human body. Do we need more detox plans? Or do we need the body to work for us? Do we need to harness the intelligence in the body that already exists in every person in this room? Everyone has an intelligence. We've compromised it. Fasting, what a beautiful, beautiful thing. Famine and feeding. We're built for that. We're built to go without food. And we're built to feast. You can overeat once in a way, and you can fast as well. It works beautifully for the human body. But we're constantly overeating, and then we try to punish the body with long fasts. It doesn't work that way. Everything works within a rhythm. You all dance to all this beautiful music this morning. Imagine there was no electronic music, and it was a band playing. And one of the artists played out of tune. From harmony and rhythm, you go to disharmony. The rhythm is broken. You may stop dancing and then start again as they pick it up. Disharmony. Everyone in this room follows a circadian cycle, a rhythm. Your heart beats with a rhythm. Your pulse, your lungs operate at a rhythm. Everything is a rhythm. Why do you enjoy electronic music? Why do people who take substances enjoy it at a different high? Because the frequencies and the rhythm are all controlled by the DJ and by the substance. I'm giving you an example, okay? We operate with rhythms. Your digestive system has a rhythm. Now you tell me what happens if your digestive system is out of rhythm. What happens? You have disharmony. Now you can call that acidity, bloating, constipation, indigest indigestion, dysbiosis, whatever you want. And you can take all the pills and all the concoctions to help with that. But what makes sense to you in the simplest way? Let my body move back into rhythm and create harmony. Now, it's a practical world that we live in. We need to fly, do work, Maybe we can't maintain that rhythm, but it's not impossible. So when it comes to nutrition, the first thing is, how many hours work for you? And you don't need to do it the Western way. The Western way is put us into a box. I have nothing against the West, but they're fantastic at packaging any concept. 16-8. Oh, I'm in the 16-8. And I ask them, why not a 17? Why not a 15? And they have no answer. My point is, your body every day will require different hours of fasting. Today you've danced, you're going to be in sessions, you're going to use a lot of brain power. The consumption of energy is going to be more. So maybe you won't be able to fast 16 hours tomorrow, and you'll feel hungry in 12 hours. Now will you eat or stay in the box? And now put your system in stress mode because you're moving to 16 hours when the body's physically hungry. So to make it simple, the circadian way of fasting is the most powerful way of fasting. It produces miracles for us every day. When I say miracles, when you have patients from Siberia or Russia say, hey, Luke, I did the circadian fast and my arthritic pain for 20 years is becoming less, and even I don't know how. The only scientific reason is because inflammation is coming down and your pain's coming down. What is the circadian way of fasting? Okay, don't get worried when I tell you. You can still party, you can still enjoy yourself. Sunset to sunrise, every religion talks about it. You stop eating at sunset, you start eating only after sunrise. Now, it doesn't have to be dot on sunset. Try within an hour after sunset. So in Goa, the sun sets at about 6.58, 7.2, something. At least try to get your dinner done by 8 o'clock, okay? This doesn't have to be every day. Remember, we're living in balance. Sunday night to Friday, enjoy your weekend. Sleep at 3, sleep at 4, eat what you want because we're trying to live a practical life. For some people who start living the circadian way, they live it their entire life. They no longer feel the need to eat late night meals. They automatically sleep better. So it's for you to try. There's no, if I do this, how do I socialize? Find a way. When you do this, it ties in with something called circadian nutrition. Everyone's against carbohydrates today. And yet, some of the best bodies on the planet eat carbohydrates. My point is, what works for you? In the circadian way of living, you may be carb-efficient in the morning, or you may be carb-efficient at night. So everyone tries to go low-carb at dinner time, but guess what? When we flip it on the head and we actually make them go high-carb at dinner time and low-carb in the morning, they feel better, energy levels, weights better, sugar levels come into place. It's different for everyone. You've got to find your space by doing it. No one can tell you how, not even myself. 
Your body will tell you how much to eat at every interval. How can a piece of paper with food written on at what time you should eat ever, ever be closely intelligent to the working of the human body? Does your diet make sense right now? We can have a food structure. What are the foods that I need for my immune system, inflammation? And from that food system, you can form your eating plans accordingly. But you don't have to eat like everyone on Instagram. Absolutely not. So the first rule of nutrition is gaps between your meals. Now, of course, if you're highly diabetic, you have a lot of acidity, you need to take medications, and your doctors want you to eat in a particular interval, please follow that for everyone else. Remember, 90 minutes to 120 minutes, if you want to use the power of your MMC, don't eat in between. You can have water, plain water, not the American way, coffee, green tea on a fast. You are not fasting when you put something with caffeine into your system. Break your fast, have all the coffee that you want. You're stimulating cortisol and adrenaline in an empty system that doesn't have any food. That is not fasting the right way. If you're fasting the right way, do it the right way or don't do it at all. What's the second rule of nutrition? We're not talking about food today. How many of you eat with guilt? Whether it's a chocolate, whether I see some hands up there, ice cream, whatever it is, okay? Guilt is a negative emotion. What does guilt do? It increases your cortisol, moves you to the sympathetic nervous system, which actually shuts down your digestive system. How can you digest when you're in the sympathetic nervous system? If you want to eat something that you feel is not meant for you, you either eat it with love, eat it with happiness, or don't eat it at all. Allow your body's intelligence to work for you. Now, of course, I have people who misuse the statement and they come and say, hey, Luke, you know, uh, I'm eating samosas and chocolate cake every day with love and stuff like that. You know, I mean, you know, people twist words and stuff like that, you know. But what I'm trying to say is, when you give in to your cravings, that's how you break cravings. I have a lot of patients who say, Luke, I'm addicted to ice cream. I tell them, for the next week before we start, eat ice cream in the afternoon and in the night, every single day, and come back to me. But then the cravings already started too. What do we crave for? Why do we crave? Why do we crave when things are a little difficult to get or they're forbidden and stuff like that? So give in. Go have all you want and now come back. Are you ready? Yep, I'm ready. I don't think I want to see ice cream for a while. So the whole point is, the second way, how do we activate the digest digestive system, which is everything? I want all of you to close your eyes right now. Okay, close your eyes. My eyes are open so I can see you. All right? Now I want you to imagine, just listen to what I say. Imagine I am giving you a juicy, sour lemon. And I'm asking you to cut this lemon, okay, this really juicy lemon. As you cut it, the juice is trickling onto your fingers. You can smell the fresh lemon. And now I'm asking you to take that lemon and touch it to your tongue. Lick the lemon. Feel the lemon juice in your mouth. Feel it. Be with that sensation for a bit. All that juice of that lemon on your tongue, it's sour. Open your eyes. What have you noticed happened? Saliva. Yeah, it happened while I was speaking. A thought of a lemon can stimulate the production of saliva. It doesn't end there. What is that saliva doing now which you swallowed? It's going into your system and giving a signal to the human body to start producing hydrochloric acid because the body doesn't know that I'm talking to you. All it knows is it works on communication, hormones and communication, enzymes. Your Saliva contains amylase and lipase. It's stimulating your digestive system to start right now. Okay? The thought of a lemon has the power to stimulate digestion. Now think about all the negative chronic thoughts you think. What is it stimulating at a physical level? We'll come back to that. Chew your food. Eat what you want. Okay? Not literally. Eat but chew your food. Digestion starts in the mouth. There is magic in saliva. People say, Luke, I want to burn fat. How fast do you finish your meals then? Oh, five minutes. Burning of fat starts with you chewing your food because you have lipase that breaks down fat. The process of breakdown of fat starts in your mouth and carbohydrates as well, amylase. Chew your food. Number three, Stop these working lunches or eating in a hurry because you've got to get your work done. Once in a way, fine, because your digestive system doesn't work when you're stressed. So why eat? You're better off not eating, 
finish your work and then sit down and have a peaceful meal. These are the basics. Superfoods don't matter if you're not doing these basics the right way. When you eat mindfully, your body tells you when to stop. How can I tell you whether you need 2,000 calories and 3,000 calories? You know that there are people who count calories? There's an unaccountable number of 800 to 1,000 calories that they don't take into consideration. The brain, the brain burns that many calories in a day. Are you eating for that? And that's why people who try to cut down on their food, they feel lethargic and frustrated and snappy and angry and all of that. Why? Because you're eating lesser than your body needs. These are the rules of nutrition. How do you know if your nutrition is working for you? When you wake up in the morning, you should automatically have the urge to pass a stool. If not immediately, at least within an hour or two hours. Now, don't get worried if you're not having that, okay? Don't get worried about that. It's just how nature works. While you're sleeping, all the waste has been accumulated. The moment you wake up into that position, okay, you squeeze, you get out of bed, or you get up from the floor that you're sleeping, okay? The circadian rhythm starts. Your eyes open, it connects with light. The body knows it's awake. The first thing, eliminate. Why do we clean our homes in the morning first? Eliminate. Now, the body gives you an urge. You go to the, to the, to the bathroom and you pass a stool. Nutrition's working for you. Hopefully you didn't strain to pass that stool out or you didn't have like IBS symptoms or constipation. These are simple things. I'm teaching you to listen to your body. You'll have all come here to connect deeply, inner. I love the concept of life plug-in, inner connection. Okay, it's the same thing with nutrition. Now, of course, when it comes to diseases, you gotta eat for your disease. An ER positive breast cancer will have to eat for their disease because of the hormone involved. A prostate cancer patient, a diabetic, an Alzheimer's patient, an autoimmune patient has to eat for their disease. But we're not talking about that today. We're talking about the basics. Nutrition, simple. I'm not even mentioned the word organic yet. And I'll tell you why. Organic's good. Support your local farmers, support the environment. We deal, everyone's aware of Tata Memorial Hospital? Yeah, handles under poverty line cases of cancer for children and adults. What do they eat? Do they even come close to the diets that we can consume? Almonds, pumpkin seeds, proteins, nothing. Yet they heal equally, some of them better, than people living in urban cities. So do you think food is really the deal breaker over here? The game changer? No, they go back and they have a carb-heavy meal with lentils and, and rotis and jar and bajra. They don't have concoctions like wheatgrass and all these things that we have. But they're still surviving and many of them are thriving. So yes, nutrition is important, but it's not everything. It's not everything. You can be basic with your nutrition, but smarter with your movement, emotional wellness, and sleep. I'm gonna move straight into adequate exercise. Movement. The body is designed to move. Why do you feel so happy when you're dancing? It creates a natural energy. Where does that energy come from? Oxygen that you intake, blood circulation that your heart is pumping. You dance faster, you're more energetic. You can get ecstatic when you connect the mind and the body would even dance because you're in control of your prana, your oxygen. That's why pranayama can make you ecstatic as well. That's the concept. There's no explanation for the drugs and dancing because it's the drugs working there. I'm talking about without that. It's circulation, movement when you move. The brain gets a signal that everything is okay. When we're sedentary, the brain gets a signal, slow down. This is not normal. And that's why we get warnings with tight glutes, tight hip flexors, the calf muscles start to hurt after a while. It's not natural, but again, practical. Some of you may have jobs which require you to sit, and that's absolutely fine. When I consult with a patient, I sit, because when I stand, they get a little overwhelmed. They think I'm in a hurry, so I gotta sit. The point is, you can be sitting for 45 minutes, you can stand up for one minute, touch your toes, stretch, get a glass of water. That's enough to start the circulation of the lymphatic system. Stand up, everyone, for a minute. We practice what we preach. I'm still gonna go on talking. Just lift your hands up, touch your toes, take a swing, and sit back down. You're keeping your blood circulating. As simple as that. Now, which are the best exercises in the world? Which are the best exercises in the world? Remember biometrics, it's different for everyone. What suits you? What exercise do you do that prevents you 
from injury, maintains your weight, keeps you feeling happy, keeps you inspired and motivated to continue working out. That is the best exercise for you. Whether it's yoga, it's walking, it's a combination, it's weightlifting, it's CrossFit, it's playing a game, it doesn't matter if it suits your body goals and your lab reports. It's as simple as that. When I look at data of over 10,000 patients, and we look at all parameters, which are the two exercises that come out on the top list that have worked with people in all dimensions? A combination of yoga and walking. That doesn't make weightlifting bad, but it's just showing you how simplicity can give you the best results. Now, of course, you want to have a body like a bodybuilder. Walking and yoga is not going to cut it for you. You have a different goal. You exercise according to your goal. Over-exercising. Whoever said you need to work out six days a week and take a break on the seventh day? Who said that? Who said you need five days of a workout? Who? I want you to reflect on this. Remember we spoke about limiting mindsets and belief? Why do bodybuilders have such great bodies besides the supplements that they take? They eat, sleep, and train. Every day, they eat, sleep, train, eat, sleep, train. Recovery. The more you work out, the more recovery you need. If the body doesn't have recovery, you increase inflammation. Yep, you look better, everything will look better, but you'll start having inflammation and you need more glutamine for muscle recovery. Why isn't your body recovering on its own when you're looking at it the holistic way? Why can't you work out Monday? Tuesday's a break. Wednesday? Thursday's a break. Why? Is your body going to change? In fact, it will thrive. It'll even be better because our mind is filled that we need to do something every day for our health. If you follow a simple concept of after breakfast, lunch, and dinner, that's if you eat breakfast. You walk for 10 minutes after breakfast, after lunch, after dinner. The biggest change in your body is the control of your blood sugar levels, whether you have diabetes or not. Or not. And that gives you 30 minutes of walk and activity in a day, over and above what else you've done. You can work out one hour a day in the morning and have a sedentary job. Your one hour workout is practically useless. There's a term for it sedentary active. You're not active. If you have a one-hour workout, but you're sitting for the next nine hours, you have to be active. Now, you couldn't do that one-hour workout, but you've got activity during the day. There's, there's a reason I walk and I talk, because I'm getting steps. Every movement is, 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 is important for us. So my point is, what is the exercise that works for you? People come and say, Luke, I have belly fat. Should I weight train? Should I do CrossFit? And no, relax. First, you tell me if you have a thyroid problem. Because if you have a thyroid problem, intensive workout is the worst thing that you could be doing. And then we slow down the workouts, heal the thyroid, and now you go do what you want, CrossFit or whatever it is. Everyone is unique. Everyone is different. So you've got to select the exercise. A holistic workout plan looks like this. It trains flexibility. It trains mobility. It trains muscle. Whether you want to become muscular or not is not your choice. It's important for you for aging and for the health of your bones. When I say build muscle, I'm not talking about big muscle. I'm talking about muscle tone, which you can get with yoga. Because muscle tone works for us. Muscle works for us, for our hormones, for our testosterone, for our bone health. So as we age, we should actually be engaging in weight-bearing exercises. Weight, again, doesn't mean a physical weight. Walking is a weight-bearing exercise, resistance bands, yoga, when you hold the asana for a little longer time, these are all weight-bearing exercises. Keep your workouts simple and consistent. Don't be the person who works out for one week and then you realize, oh, two weeks and I'm going to travel and work and stop your entire program. Find something that works for you, whether you travel, whether you don't travel, no matter how busy and how important you may be. The mind doesn't care who you are. All it cares about is survival. Am I getting what I need to keep this body alive and thriving? Let's move straight into sleep. A lot of people say, Luke, four hours, because I want to become the next Elon Musk. I need to become a billionaire. I need to become a multimillionaire. So I say, so why do you need four hours of sleep? I say, no, okay, because I read all the success stories of these people. It is true, very few people in the world have a gene in them that allows them to sleep only four hours. Very few people. A lot of other people like to think they have that gene and they compromise on their sleep. 
I'm, I'm going to give you three points to make you understand why sleep is so important. I don't believe in preaching. I believe in reflection. Why, when you wake up in the morning, does your mouth smell? Why do you have bad breath? Why do you have dirt between your eyes? Why is your first urine warmer? What does it signify? If you fell the previous day while playing and you got a cut, the scab doesn't form during the day. You sleep and you wake up and there's a scab. Guys, any guys over here find their beard growing during the day? No, you wake up with stubble. Women as well. The point is, while you sleep, everything I mentioned is what can happen only during sleep. The foul smell from your mouth, the dirt between your eyes, the warm urine is a sign of detoxification happening while you sleep. Hormonal balance can only happen while you sleep. No one is balancing hormones right now while you're awake. Circadian rhythm. Eyes are open, there's light in your eyes. Hormones are performing their function, but they will rebalance when you sleep. The scab forming, the stubble growing, is a sign of growth and repair that happens only while you sleep. What happens if I cut sleep? I affect all of these mechanisms. And then we wonder why young girls today and young boys and men have hormonal imbalances. PCOS, ovarian issues, infertility, ER positive breast cancers at the age of 22, 25. Hormonal imbalance. Everyone knows it's a hormonal imbalance. Let's take some birth control pills. Let's take some hormonal tablets. I'm not against it. There's the right time and the right place to take it. But what is the root cause? And you get these people to sleep better, the hormones start changing. The cycles start changing. Everything starts changing. Sleep is the most important drug of the human body. If it was not important, it wouldn't be built into the intelligence of your human body. But it's the easiest thing to compromise on. The easiest thing. So let me tell you, because I thought it would be impossible for busy people and important people to keep their sleep in place. We handle the royal families of the Middle East. We handle jet-set billionaires of the world. Today, they are sleeping for seven to eight hours. If they can make it happen, there's hope that we can too. Where there's a will, there's a way, period. There are different situations. You're a pilot, you're a nurse, you're a doctor, you have night shifts. There are still ways to adapt, but it does impact your health as well because you break the circadian rhythm. So by me telling you this, does this mean you can't party late into the night? You can't watch Netflix late into the night? No. How many days in a week do you want to party? If you're a party person and that's your livelihood, you'll say every day. And then those people sleep till about 12 in the afternoon and they balance it. They find their balance. But for everyone else, you party on Friday, party on Saturday. Five days of the week, respect the circadian rhythm of the human body if you want to thrive. If you don't want to thrive, the world has everything from pills to everything else for you. How do you improve your sleep? Let's say you can't sleep right now. You can do chamomile teas and poppy seeds and all of that stuff. They help. You can do left nostril breathing. You can meditate. You can do pranayamas. They help. But I'm going deeper than that. How do you reset the circadian rhythm of sleep in your body? It's very simple. I want each of you not over the next two days because you'll have a lot of fun activities planned in the night. When you go back home, select a time in the morning that you can wake up at, whether it's five or six or seven, whatever time it is, okay? And no matter what time you go to bed, you wake up at that time in the morning. You may be tired, you may be groggy, but wake up. Don't sleep in the afternoon, okay? Let the first day pass and the second day. By the third day, you'll find yourself going to sleep a little bit earlier and sleeping deeper. And simultaneously, you'll find yourself waking up at the same time that you set without an alarm. All you've done is reset the circadian rhythm of the body. Sometimes it takes three days, sometimes it takes a week. Don't give up. Everyone's different. That's how you reset the cycle, the circadian rhythm of the human body. You have left nostril breathing. How many of you use ne left nostril breathing to sleep deeper at night? How many of you do that? It's super powerful, great, great everyone. Super, super powerful, even if you sleep well at night. Try this tonight. Before you sleep, back straight, close your right nostril, and just gently inhale and, don't do it now, that's gonna put you to sleep, I want you to listen, okay? But I can give you something, if you wanna stay energized and you are feeling sleepy, do the opposite. 
close the left nostril and inhale and exhale through the right nostril. Everyone's doing it, so I don't know what to make of that, whether you're actually sleepy, but kidding. So the point is, energize, you breathe through the right nostril. Close the left nostril, gentle inhale and exhale. Sleep, left. What's the science? Sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system. The easiest way to start training your body to move from the sympathetic nervous system, which is stress, the parasympathetic nervous, which is rest and digest. You cannot digest food in the sympathetic nervous system. It's impossible. You can't sleep in the sympathetic nervous system. You have to be in the right so central nervous system to sleep or to digest. How do I move to the sympath from sympathetic to parasympathetic in less than a minute? I slow down my exhales. I trick my body. There may be stress in this room right now. Let's say we have a lion in this room and I let the lion free, okay? There are two ways all of you will react. Some of you will prepare to run. Some of you will prepare to fight, defend yourself. Fight and flight response. That's the sympathetic nervous system. While you see the lion, what's happening in your body? Your blood pressure goes up. Your cholesterol goes up. Your blood sugar levels go up. Your muscles constrict to give you energy to fight or to flee. The lion's dead, the lion's gone or whatever, okay? You take a deep breath. You were holding onto your breath. You were shallow breathing when you were in the sympathetic nervous system. That deep breath, because the event is over, now stimulates the brain that the threat is gone. Your breathing starts slowing down. What happens when your breathing starts slowing down? Your blood sugar levels, your pressure, everything comes back. Homeostasis. You come back to normal. Now you can sleep. Now you can eat and digest. When you were in sympathetic, the body immediately shuts down the digestive system to conserve energy. Because if you're eating something, most of the energy we consume goes into digestion. 75 to 80%, which is huge. It won't, let you, it won't give you that strength to run out of the room or to fight. Now you can't debate certain laws of nature. If the apple's thrown up, it is gonna fall. The sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system is going to work the way it is. So if you want to trick your body right now into coming into parasympathetic, all you need to do is take a nice, long, deep inhale at your own pace. And then your exhale should be longer than your inhale. So if your inhale was four seconds, try to keep your exhale eight seconds. If it's not eight, it's six, it's fine. By doing that, cortisol falls, adrenaline falls. By doing that, it sends a message through your hormones to communicate there's no threat. Relax. All healing in the human body can only happen in a state of complete deep rest or relaxation. People have to learn how to relax today. If I ask you to relax right now, what's your mechanism? How do you relax right now? What's the mechanism you choose? Some people choose to smoke. Okay, we're not judging anyone. Some people choose to go for a walk. Some people want to listen to music. Some people want to dance. Some people just want to close their eyes. Find your way of relaxation, a healthy way. Because every time you learn to relax and you actually relax, you allow the intelligence in your human body to do its work that no doctor, no nutritionist, no healer can do for you. Healing can only happen in a state of complete rest, which is either sleep, which is again why sleep is important. I'll give you an example of a chemo patient who comes sleep deprived for chemotherapy. The CBC, complete blood work, white blood cells are all over the place. The first question asks is, how many hours did you sleep? Oh, I couldn't, you know, I was stressed out, I was watching Netflix at three in the morning. And you have a patient who slept well. They come in with a stronger immune system for the chemo. Now is the problem with chemo, or is the problem with you coming with a weaker system and taking a drug which is toxic with an intention to help you? It starts with us. Sleep is everything. And a lot of people say, I just can't sleep. Yes, because you've gotten used to a cycle of just not sleeping. How are you gonna change it? Try. And what's the right amount of sleep? There is no right amount. The question you have to ask yourself is, when you wake up in the morning, do you feel rested or do you feel sleep deprived? If you feel sleep deprived, there's your answer. Your sleep wasn't enough for you. If you feel rested even in four hours or five hours, you're set. If you're the person who wakes up and needs coffee to start the day, there's nothing wrong with coffee. But if you need it to start the day, you know you're sleep deprived. You're fatigued, you need a stimulant. Have your coffee, but not because you're sleep deprived. Fix your sleep. This is the basis of all healing. Your emotional healing sessions, your therapies, everything works better when the body is well rested. Let's move into the fourth vertical, which is 
Emotional wellness. Emotional wellness. Why do I keep it at the end? Because nutrition is insignificant. If we are emotionally in control, we know the right foods to choose. We know how much to eat. We know when to stop. We know when to sleep. We know how we feel when we wake up in the morning. We know and we are mindful that the body needs exercise and we don't skimp on it. But when we're emo emotionally chaotic, we eat the wrong foods because we want to feel better. We think sugar makes us feel better. It does at a neuro exciter level. It doesn't take away your sadness. It doesn't take away your pain. It doesn't take away your anger, your resentment, your guilt. It gives you temporary happiness like a drug for a short period of time. How much are you going to take? How much more sugar are you going to eat to solve a problem that sugar can never solve or quick fixes can never solve? The human mind is powerful beyond measure. There's a reason why people try to learn manifestation. Manifestations also become a huge fad. A huge fad because people do it the wrong way. The problem is not with manifestation. So when you're emotionally down, can you be productive? Can you be creative? Absolutely not. So you are going to make wrong decisions with the previous three verticals I just spoke about. So if I'm going to start today with a body goal, I first have to get my mind set. Otherwise, I'll start and I'll give up. Then people come and say, I want to be motivated, Luke. Motivation is only for people who are not yet committed to their goal. I'll say that again. Motivation is only for people who are not committed to their goal. What you want to be is inspired. Motivation has a shelf life. How many of us can watch 10 motivational videos on YouTube and feel great for one hour, two hours, three hours, and the next day, we're searching for more motivational videos? Why? You don't need more motivation. You need more commitment to your goal. You have a goal, and you have a result that you want to achieve. Between the goal and the result is a process. Are you willing to commit to that process? No matter what it is, a better relationship, a better body, healing from a disease, a spiritual path that you want to take, are you willing to commit to the process? Otherwise, it just remains a goal and a desired result. It doesn't change. For that, you need emotional stability. Now, when I say emotional stability, it doesn't mean you're not going to go through ups and downs and heartache and breakups and you know, experience all the negative seven deadly sins that exist in the world and every human being. Of course you are but you're emotionally strong to identify and respond rather than react. Everyone in this room is going through ups and downs right now. Everyone, whether you want to build a facade around it or not, everyone's gone through pain. If not, you will go through pain. When I say pain, I'm not, I don't mean physical pain. It could be any kind of pain because suffering is part of everyone's life, whether you like it or not. There's a whole population of people trying to escape suffering. You can't. Suffering is a part of life. Embrace it. The moment you embrace it, it becomes easier to manage. Whoever told you you should suppress sadness, depression, grief, these are emotions that you're meant to feel, not disguise. Oh, I'm sad today. Let me go and drink away my sorrows. You've not solved the problem. Have the drink, but do the work. Feel the feeling. Exhaust the feeling out of you. When someone dies in your family, a loved one, Today, most people don't have time to grieve. And then they have an incomplete process of grieving. And over the next months and next years, they're emotionally, they never went through grieving, acceptance that my father or my mother or my brother or my sister is no more. Cry, feel the feeling, be with the family, whatever. Exhaust the feeling and move back into your life. Of course, you'll be sad whenever you think of the loss, but you've exhausted the feeling. The same way we want to exhaust only happiness. We want instant gratification. We want to exhaust everything that makes us only feel good. And after a while, you still feel empty. Why? You can't exhaust any energy, positive or negative. You have to go through. A lot of people in this world today have everything, but yet they feel empty. And so they try to do more, to find that feeling, fill that void but they never find it because they don't have to do more. They have to connect within and find out and start appreciating what they already have. Putting energy and attention on what really matters. One side has happiness, one side has sadness. 
where you choose to put all your attention is exactly how you're going to feel. Exactly. Why not embrace both? Why are you trying to escape sadness? Do you think you're entitled not to go through a breakup? Do you think you're entitled to someone not cheating on you? It can be your intention and your wish, but you're not entitled to that. You're not entitled to that. No human being is entitled. And because we build expectations and entitlements, we create our own emotional distress. How could I get cancer? Why not? Why not? What makes you, oh, I worked out, I did this. Cancer is not about you working out and eating well. It's a multifactorial disease that connects way deeper than just that. Why not? It's happened. We can wish it never happened. But now, move to action. What do I need to do? That brings me to anxiety. The biggest problem in today's generation, most, I'm anxious. Why are you seeing anxiety as a negative thing? Anxiety is a beautiful survival mechanism. If your body didn't give you an anxiety feeling, how would you react? How would you respond? How would you take action? So you have to see anxiety as a warning. Now, if you do nothing about that, you become a slave to anxiety. But if you move to action, okay, Luke, okay, uh, there's something going wrong. Five of your patients were given the wrong chemotherapy drug. Okay, anxiety, of course, is a possibility of loss of life right now. Immediately, I can say, oh no, what's gonna happen? Am I gonna be sued? What's gonna happen to my team? What's gonna happen to the patient's family? But anxiety has given me the indicator. Now move to action, what can I do? What can I do? Get to doctors, check the vitals of the patients, can we flush out, can move to action. Everyone in this room has the ability to move to action even in the most, the most dreadful cases. Let me give you an example. I spoke about this at a corporate event a couple of weeks ago. And a young boy called me up and he said, Luke, you know, you said move to action at any point in your life. Now tell me what to do. My father has six hours left to live. He's on his deathbed. What do I do? I said, get your family. You have six hours. Give your father the best farewell that you could ever do because there is nothing else to do. You can cry later. You can grieve later. But right now, what can you do? And he sent me pictures. They had balloons around his bed and they were it was the most beautiful thing I ever saw. Action. If you don't move to action, you remain a victim in victim mode. People in victim mode are stuck. The only thing to get out of victim mode is action, even the smallest little action, whether it's asking for help or whether it's enough is enough. There are two powerful words when it comes to stress before we end this vertical. Today, everyone is like, I'm so stressed. It's become like society talk. Oh, I'm stressed, I'm stressed, I need a drink. I it's okay, but be careful what you speak. Every word you speak becomes a seed that you plant in your subconscious mind. What is stress? When you understand this today, I only want you to reflect on everything that is not going well in your life. Stress is never a person, a thing, or an event. Stress is the way you relate to a person, a thing, or an event. Remember this. Remember this, if you're in a relationship right now where your partner is the biggest stressor, it's the way you relate to your partner. Yes, your partner may be toxic, but it's the way you relate. Unless you can change the way you relate, you will never, ever dissolve stress. I can put 10 potential problems right now. Everyone in the room will react differently. Some of you will see it as stress. Some of you will see it as challenge. Some of you will be, it's no big deal. It's the way you relate to it. It's the way you relate to it. So today, anything that stresses you out, okay, don't focus on the problem. Don't focus on the person, the thing, or the event. Focus on how can I change the way I relate to this. That is the simplicity of stress. There are two powerful words that I want to leave you with. No matter how many problems you have, you may have or you don't have. They're easy words to say, difficult to practice, but not impossible. Acceptance and letting go. When you can master acceptance and letting go, which also involves, what's the difficult part? You, sometimes you've got to dissolve the ego. Sometimes you have to say, I'm wrong. Sometimes you've got to say, I'm sorry. Sometimes you've got to say, like, I was lost. Only when you dissolve the ego, acceptance. Think of all your problems right now. If you tag each of your problems with either acceptance or letting go. Is it a problem anymore? People come and say, Luke, I'm stuck in a toxic relationship. I say, yeah, so it's toxic. Can you leave? No, I have a kid. Okay, fine. Can you accept your partner? 
then good, you can continue living in that relationship because by accepting your partner, their behavior no longer troubles you. If not, you gotta let go. That's the truth. There is no midway between let go and acceptance. There is no midway. It's either acceptance or letting go. You can start the process to build towards acceptance or build towards letting go, but you gotta make a choice at some point. You can take your time to make that choice, but you gotta make a choice. Acceptance or letting go, it's such a beautiful thing. When you accept that, okay, this is how it's gonna be, you start to flow with life. People think the more I meditate, the more I flow. No, absolutely not. The more you meditate, the more clarity you have. The more mindfulness you have to decide what you should accept and what you should let go. So when you break down emotional health, of course, some people need medication because they have genuine imbalances in their dopamine, their serotonin, and all of that stuff. I'm not talking about that. Everyone else, the answer is within you. It's within you. But we're scared to look within, because what's the story that's gonna come out? Shit, Luke, you really are an angry person. Oh, Luke, you really have a big ego. Oh, Luke, really, uh, you, you actually displayed envy over there. Oh, Luke, yeah, you're, you're, you, know, you look lustfully at that person. The truth's gonna come out, and you don't wanna accept that. That's not me, because we're all wearing a facade to be someone in public. You gotta break that down. Break that down slowly. That's your evolution. Tools like meditation, everything else are powerful to help you. But the person who comes and says, Luke, I'm trying to meditate away my problems, I say, stop right there because you are failing. Meditation doesn't solve your problems. Chanting doesn't solve your problems. More yoga, more nutritious food doesn't solve your problems. You gotta do the self work. You gotta be honest. Everyone in this room, including myself, we have a perfect truth and we have a perfect lie within us. Most of us are aware of what our perfect truth and our perfect lie is. If you're willing to work with that, okay, you start to evolve. It's difficult, it's not easy. If your perfect truth is someone, something that challenges you, the facade that you've built to show everyone, or your partner or society, it's gonna be very difficult to overcome that, but not impossible, not impossible. Anyone's heard of the dark night of the soul? Anyone experienced the dark night of the soul? Okay, it's a beautiful concept. What does it mean? I'll put it very simply. If we really want to evolve or we want rebirth in the most non-philosophical way, we gotta shed who we think we are, every inhibition. So sometimes when you hit rock bottom, okay, you're actually going through the dark night of the soul. You've hit rock bottom to make a choice. If I wanna get back up there, these are the changes I need to make. If you choose to make those changes, you go through the dark night of the soul. It can be one day, it can be 30 days, it can be one year. If you choose to stay rock bottom and victim mode, how could it happen to me? I need medication, I need help, I need counselors. I don't have a problem with that. But you don't go through the process of complete breakdown before you can evolve again. It's not as dangerous as it sounds. It's not as easy as it sounds either. But it is possible. When you look back at all the mistakes you made, the failures in your life, what do you see? When you look at all the death that's happened around, what do you see? Only one side of it? Or do you see the lessons that you can learn from it? How many of you have had multiple relationships over the year, and all you do is talk about how bad those relationships were, uh, maybe not over the years, maybe, and for those who had over the years, the year as well. My point is, when you look at those relationships today, look back and say from each of those relationships, what lesson can I take? That will change the way you perceive relationships. You perceive men and women and every human species. Because otherwise, we're only judging all the time. So yes, meditation is great. The subconscious mind, what a beautiful thing. I'll tell you two things. I can only talk about the subconscious mind, but we have someone amazing who's gonna teach you how to program the subconscious mind right after me. The subconscious mind doesn't know the difference between a truth and a lie. Why is this so exciting? Why is this so exciting? Because you can decide to feed your subconscious mind what you do. Let me give you an example. We, we teach our chemotherapy patients before they go into chemo. We ask them, oh, so you've Googled, obviously, about the side effects. List them down. Oh, look, hair fall, pigmentation, diarrhea, loose motions, constipation, loss of skin color, whatever. And now I say, when you go into that chemotherapy and it's entering your system, all I want you to do is visualize the way you want chemo to work for you. So you can see it as a light 
as a liquid going into you and it's actually doing the opposite of the side effects. It's growing your hair, lie to your subconscious mind because it doesn't know the difference. But the outcome of what you're thinking is gonna be the outcome of your physical self. That's how the basic principle of manifestation works. How can I put manifestation in a minute to you? Three things that you need to do. And I've not learned this. My entire life, most of it is built on manifestation. So I relate to it. Number one, you have to have a crystal clear vision of what you want, period. Right now, I can pick up random people and ask, what is the kind of relationship you want? And most people want to know, oh, I want a loving partner who will look after me. Okay, no, go deeper, go deeper. You'll get that on the first date because everyone will try to be loving and caring on the first date. I want you to go deeper. And I say, what is the kind of health that you visualize? Yeah, I just want to be healthy and strong and fit and good looking. Go deeper. I want a strong immune system that even if I get hit with the deadliest disease, those soldiers are going to go in and kill. Financial abundance. Oh, I want a million dollars. I think a three million dollars. No. Don't visualize money. Visualize abundance. Because when you have abundance, everything that you have, whether it's a million dollars or not, becomes sufficient for you and you enjoy it. So never, never visualize pinpoint. You have to go beyond that. So what do I visualize for? Every single morning. I'm way beyond. I did everything I spoke to you. I visualize numbers. I visualize all of that stuff. It doesn't solve any purpose in your life. Today I visualize for strength, courage, a feeling of bliss, because that's a feeling that you love. Abundance, which means whatever I have, is sufficient for me, and it makes me happy. I don't decide whether it's sufficient. I feel it's sufficient. And now, I can handle death, I can handle whatever, because I'm visualizing strength and courage. Look deeper. You can break it down into milestones. I visualize I'm gonna finish the marathon in Chicago next week. You can visualize those things as well. But I'm saying go up. So number one, crystal clear vision of what you want. Whether it's a partner you're seeking. How do you want that partner to be? Do the physical part as well, but emotionally. Visualize that your partner, when you're sick, is looking after you, you're looking after your partner, you're in the best countries in the world, eating food, laughing, happy. You're not fighting, but you're forgiving. Visualize everything, not just the happy part. People don't know what they want because they're too busy on social media or too busy comparing their lives with other people. So today you want this, tomorrow you want something else, and then the day after. Crystal clear vision. So that's the first step, crystal clear vision. Number two. How will you feel when it comes true? How will it feel? You gotta feel that in your mind. Like, person A has cancer. Okay, visualizing, I'm gonna be healthy, cancer-free. The doctor's telling me, hey, you're in remission, go travel. You're on the beach, cancer-free. You got a whole chance for a new life. How are you gonna feel? Feel it before it's even happened. And then, surrender. Don't try to micromanage it. Do not try to put you know, points and stuff like that. There is action and work to be done. Don't try to micromanage it. That is the simplest way to build manifestation in your life. Positive thinking never works. How long can you go positively thinking when a mind out of 60 to 70,000 thoughts will throw you all kinds of thoughts? So, I'm gonna end this with something very simple. How do you stop negative thinking? How do you stop thinking about your ex or the partner who betrayed you or the money you lost or you got cheated from or the disease that life dealt you? How do you stop thinking about that? You can't, but you can weaken that pattern. There's something called neuroplasticity. When you read that, you'll fall in love with your human mind and your body. You'll fall in love with it. Every time we think, there's a neural circuit being formed. So if you heard me say things that you haven't heard, Today, it's in your mind. If you think about it more, the neural circuit's gonna get stronger and stronger. Can I inspire or motivate anyone in this room to stop brushing, brushing their teeth in the morning? Can I, can I motivate you? Can I inspire you, anyone? Impossible, why? Because by you doing it from the time you were a child, every time you brush your teeth, you strengthen that neural circuit, which is so strong, so strong. In hypnosis, which I don't do, you can because you program the subconscious mind. Now, imagine I'm constantly thinking a negative thought. You can't stop the negative thought from coming, impossible. But each time I think a negative thought or I say something negative, that person is like this, he makes me so angry, I just hate him, okay? You're strengthening it more and more. So when you think of it again the next time, it's getting stronger and stronger. So now, since I can't stop the negative thought, what do I do? 
So I start off again. Oh, I hate that person. He makes me so angry. He's so annoying. But I have to learn to accept and forgive and come on, there must be something good. What have I done? I've changed the neural circuit now. There's a new neural circuit that comes on the old neural circuit. And the next time I do it again, and I do it again, I'm building a new neural circuit. What does it take? The power of your thoughts, repetition, and practice. So if you go on saying cancer is an end-stage disease, that's what's going to happen. If you go on saying you're not worthy of love, that is what is going to happen. It's nothing airy-fairy about it. It's the way your subconscious mind works. And that is the importance of emotional health. Pranayama, meditation, all of these are tools. But finally, you need to do the work. A lot of people approach me already saying, Luke, how do I find my life purpose? And I'm going to be very blunt about this. You find your life purpose by living your life, not by stopping to live. A lot of people stop living their life thinking that I'll go to the mountains. I don't have a problem with that. Go to the mountains. But you find your life purpose by living your life. I found my life purpose by doing a hundred things which didn't make me happy. But I had to do those hundred things to find the one thing that makes me happy. A housewife told me the other day, Luke, I found my life purpose. I said, what? Being a housewife. I love cooking for my family. I love seeing the joy in their face. I like giving them hot food. I thought that was beautiful. That's a life purpose. Why should society define the life purpose for you? That you've got to be a billionaire, successful, well-dressed all the time, or whatever it is. Your life purpose will be found when you go through journeys and you live life. A lot of people stop living life. They say, I'm going to meditate for six months in the mountains. I mean, do it. And if you find it in that six months, great. If you don't, you've got to get back to living life. And you will find it at some point. It also depends on what your def definition of a life purpose is. Some people compare their life purposes with other people. Remember biometrics? Remember the uniqueness of the human body? So we've not spoken about diets yet. This is the constitution of the human body and the mind in the most, simplest, in the, in the most simplified way. My most complicated patients who come today, I tell them the same things. Of course, we tweak their plans for the disease and the side effect of drugs, but this is what we train people on. This is what we try to teach people that the answer is within you. How many of you are in control of your inner peace? Put your hands up. How many of you think you're in control of your inner peace? Few hands, and there's nothing to be ashamed of for the people who didn't put their hands up. I've not put my hand up too. The day you decide, which is right now, that I own my inner peace, and you affirm that over and over again because you own your inner peace. How many of you have given the remotes of your inner peace to other people? How many, of, how many people get swayed with the emotions of other people? You've given your inner peace away. When you give your inner peace, in, inner peace away, what do you have? Chaos in your mind. Own your inner peace. Own your inner peace. How can you start doing that? By affirming it. Three times, everyone. I own my inner peace. Peace. Louder. I own my inner peace. Feel it. Close your eyes. Feel, close your eyes. I own my inner peace. I own my inner peace. In a fight also, this comes out really well. I own my inner peace and just walk away. Like, you know, it works really well. I've done it many times, you know? Because sometimes you don't really own your inner peace and you do react and, you know, all of I get angry and stuff. I own my inner peace. Leave me alone. And I walk off. Like, you know, yeah, I own it. And then inside I'm like deep breathing and try to do everything I just told you about. You know, my point is, come back down to the basics. The human body is simple and it's got an intelligence that no one will ever understand. No one will ever understand. Be grateful for that intelligence and just find out what is the environment I got to create within me and around me so the intelligence in me thrives. When you need medicine, take it. Don't have resistance and negativity against medicine. Unless you're abusing it, of course. If not, yes, medicine can save your life. Yes, a steroid can give you back life. But if you go in and you take it with that, I don't do medicine, I don't do allopathy, they're all robbers, they're thieves and stuff like that, is it going to work? Considering you know how the subconscious mind? No. There may be times in your life where you need it. Accept it gracefully. Gratitude is about giving and also receiving. A lot of people know how to give. They don't know how to receive. They don't know how to receive. So I have an open mind. For that, you need mindfulness. So I end my session with the focus on one word, mindfulness. If you are mindful, you know what to eat, what suits your body, when to stop, what time to eat, you know when to sleep, you know what exercise works for you, what doesn't. 
You know the kind of people you want to hang around. You do the things that make you happy. Mindfulness. That is the ingredient that we prescribe to every single patient besides whatever else they need. If you are mindful, your life starts to change right now. Okay, I am mindful. I'm angry. I need to do some work. I am mindful. This makes me happy. How can I do more of it? You own your inner peace, and because you own your inner peace, you have some sort of control over your emotions. You cannot hand the remote control to other people. You can take help, but you own it, and only you can change it. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of hell is within you. It's within you. You make your own heaven and you make your own hell. I'm actually done with my session. It's open for questions and answers, please. Thank you. I have a big timer over here. It's reminding me of the time. So, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I think your session today is valuable if you can take even one little thing away. And maybe you want to implement it today. But start thinking about your life as your own. I'll touch upon one more quick point, spirituality. My favorite topic. When I talk about spirituality, I don't talk about religion. I'm giving you the simplicity of spirituality in a minute. Spirituality starts with you not abusing the gift that you've been given. Everything else on your spiritual part then follows. You can go deeper into the scriptures, the Vedas, but if you can't, if you can't respect and honor your gift of life, every other part of your spirituality is just going to be spirituality. So what can you do today to honor the gift of life? Fine, tonight I'm going to party hard, have a, have a couple of drinks, not whatever. But tomorrow, I'm going to realize I put my body through this. Now also let me give it some love, some healing, some relaxation under the digestive system. Balance. Balance. Do what you want. Have extremes, but come back down. Come back down again. And that is where spirituality starts. You know, today I have Vipassana teachers who come to me with cancer, who do 45 days of deep meditation. They are enlightened and awakened in the mind, but they've neglected the physical body. And I have physically fit people from around the world, athletes, sports people who come to me with cancer. They've aced the physical body, but they've neglected the emotional mind. It all works together. How many of you have friends who may not have great bodies, they have a little bit of fat, whatever, but their blood parameters are perfect? How many of us have friends like that? What's the difference? So whoever told you that obesity alone is the cause of all cancer? I have obese patients who have better blood parameters than models, actresses, and sports people. It again is much deeper than that. Most of these people are happy people. They don't care. They don't care. And you've got to remember, when the mind is relaxed and happy, the healing can happen. When the mind is in chaos, no amount of healing can ever happen in the human body. At a symptomatic level, yes. Otherwise, absolutely not. Question and answers, please, if anyone has any questions. Yeah. Is there a mic to go around? Yeah. Hello. Hi, this is Ujwal from New Delhi. Hi. I just Hi. wanted to understand what is surrender for manifestation. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What is surrender for manifestation? Okay. So let me give you, let, let, let's, let's have a, a quick visualization right now, okay? What do you all want from Life Plugin this year? Close your eyes. Have you got a crystal clear vision? Some of you may just want to come and meet people. Some of you want to embrace. What's your crystal clear vision? Why are you here for Life Plugin? Get that in your mind. Clear. Next step, how are you going to feel when you walk away with that? You've achieved what you came for. Done? Now surrender it. Leave it. Get back to your day. Don't keep thinking about it. That, oh, no, no, no. The organizer should have done this for me to feel better. Oh, no, no. The food wasn't good. No. Leave it. Let it unfold in its own way. That is what surrender is. You had a fight. You said the wrong things right now. What can you do? You can say sorry, but you've got to surrender. You can't keep trying to fix the problem. In life, we have to learn surrender, but most people see surrender as a loss of control. And most people are trying to control life. When you realize you are not in control of anything, anything, then you realize acceptance, letting go, and surrender at a more powerful level. Uh, hi, Luke. Aditi. Uh, thank hi. you so much. Uh, yeah, the session has been amazing. I'm sure a lot of us know a lot of things, and you know we've read, we follow you also. I'm sure, but it always helps to have a one-on-one, -on -one and and you know things that we've read just kind of hit us, and I think hopefully stay with all of us. So I had a question about the circadian rhythm uh, that is there. Um, 
I know there is usually a set pattern and most probably every person has its own. I wanted to understand how does it affect when a person is either a morning person or a night owl, right? Because I'm sure the body ideally would work in a very different way. Like yeah. for a night owl, it'll be difficult to have dinners earlier because they, the sleep patterns are very different. Like similarly, waking up in the morning for those people might be difficult. So does this differ from person to person and how would you kind of guide us on how that works? Yes, it differs. People who work night shifts, people who are pilots and have night shifts, you know, over time, the body will adapt to their circadian rhythm. It can be both ways. Of course, the most powerful one is sleep during the night and be awake during the day. That's how light, the circadian rhythm works on light. So when you close your eyes, there are millions of signals being sent to your body, even if you close your eyes right now. Because the first thing goes, is this person preparing to sleep? And you open it and there's light, there are a million other messages that go through the body. So yes, you can adapt to a particular rhythm over time. Your body does it. The circadian rhythm becomes more powerful when someone's ailing with a disease. Medication is not working anymore. You try to put them in an environment which is the circadian way of living, hoping that the intelligence of the body will be harnessed. So it's from everyone. Now let's say five days of the week we live the circadian way. Two days, we're out. The body builds a pattern around that as well. So it adapts. The human body is constantly adapting to everything. You know, how many of you have kids during the lockdown who have more exposure to uh, laptops and phones, including yourself, right? Have the eye cases really gone up? No, they haven't. We constantly check with our eye doctors, are you seeing more cases? No, why? Because believe me, it is adapting. Now, if you already had weaker eyes, more exposure could create a problem. But for everyone else, a lot of children don't have eye problems yet. Your body's also adapting to changes. It's constantly learning to adapt. And again, that's the intelligence of the body. So we don't want to push it too far. We want to respect it. So the circadian rhythm changes for everyone. Some people, it's in a different place. I usually wake up at about 6 o'clock. But today, being close to the beach, different light coming in from the window, I woke up at 5, beautifully refreshed. It's different every single day. So that's the beauty of the circadian rhythm. Just remember, in the circadian rhythm, when you live in that rhythm, your body is intelligence is more empowered to work for you. Otherwise, it's compromised. It's trying to do some other function because there's disharmony in the rhythm. Yeah. Hi, Luke. Hi. So, uh, I have a question. Is uh, eating food while watching TV bad for your health? And if yes, how do I explain this to my kids? Okay, it's a great question. I'll start with a simple study that was done in Sweden. Okay, a group of children were allowed to watch TV and eat a bowl of salad and a burger. The other group of children were given the same meal, a burger and a bowl of salad, and they were not allowed to uh, watch TV. The absorption rate of iron and calcium fell by 90% in the group that watched TV. And it didn't even budge in the group that didn't. Now, what sense does that make? Because when you're watching something, you're distracted. You're in the sympathetic nervous system because colors are changing. Multiple colors, voices, change it. You may not be watching something stressful. The moment stress comes up, adrenaline, absorption rates of all nutrients in the body fall. So the science behind it is, yes, it, it does affect us. Practicality, okay? Can you do it or not? There are many parents who do it. A lot of children don't. Sometimes you've got to put your foot down, and you just got to stop it. They don't eat, they don't eat. I don't know a single child who has died of starvation because they skipped two, three, or four meals, but they learned the lesson. Sometimes we've got to use discipline in life to change your behavior. Right? Everyone who's here to change your behavior, let me tell you that it is only going to be changed with the amazing knowledge you get in these sessions and discipline. Otherwise, knowledge only remains knowledge. Discipline and consistency is everything in every aspect of your life that you want to change. So try that. Try that. And set an example. Involve children. That We've made a family decision today where we all eat our meals together. No one watches TV. After that, we watch TV. There are different ways to make decisions. But if you use authority with them, they would rebel against you. So that's how it works. Try any of these. Yeah, try any of these and see if it works. Hi, Luke. Hi. Hi, this is Kevalia. Uh, uh, we really love your session. Thank you. Um, one thing that I have an issue is I don't have a sound sleep. Uh, I get up at 5. I, I'm very excited to do my workout. Uh, and I sleep by 10. 10:30, 11, but during the night, uh, I don't have a proper sleep, and by end of the day, I am very tired. Uh, what do you suggest? How should I? Uh, so you need to sleep deeper. You don't have to sleep longer. The depth of your sleep is more important than the length of your sleep. 
So to go into deeper sleep, there are many things you can do. I don't know why you're waking up in the night. Is it because your mind is thinking of something? You've not gone through all your sleep cycles and your waves, whether it's the alpha, the beta, the gamma waves. Which waves are you reaching? So number one is how do you wind down before bedtime? And that's why we say try not to look at screens before bedtime because that suppresses melatonin. It's, it's not because we're trying to make people's life boring. The moment you have a white light in front of you, a blue light, it suppresses melatonin. So you cut it down. I, I like this practice of getting people to plan their day before they sleep. Write down everything that you want to do, whatever's troubling you. So empty your mind onto a paper. Because if you're still thinking, you may fall asleep because the body's physically tired, but the mind keeps waking you up, thinking, and stuff like that. Your deep breathing, your pranayama before sleep is also very helpful to cultivate very deep cycles of sleep. Making the room pitch dark is one of the best things you can ever do, and you all should try this. Pitch dark room, you will, have, you will sleep like a baby. And if you can't do a pitch dark room, you know, you can use iPads or something that's not too tight around, around your head or even roll up a towel. And you know, you get these little, when you go to a spa, they put this, these iPads that have like sand on, it puts a little weight on your eyelids and you feel really good. That's also excellent. Cut off light completely, completely dark, and the body moves into the parasympathetic system at a deeper level. So you may want to try these because you have to first address why are you unable to sleep? What are the thoughts or what are your sleep cycles? Are you getting disturbed at night? Are you getting up to urinate too many times? There are many things. So reflect on that and try some of these things. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Luke. Thank you for a lovely session. Uh, you. you said mindfulness is the key ingredient which you really, really suggest everyone to follow. So uh, I would really love if you could tell us some techniques how we can follow mindfulness because there are a lot of people who struggle with uh, focusing on something because you have thousands of thoughts going around. What are the techniques which you follow or something which you can suggest to us that we should follow? How many of you enjoyed the sunrise today? How many of you took a walk to the beach just mindlessly? Or you took a walk to the beach and what can you take away that really gave you an awe moment or a woe moment on the beach today? Was it silence? Was it the color of the sand? Because I've come down from North Goa and the beaches here seem like I was out of India, you know? What was your wow moment today when you woke up in the morning? Are you mindful of that? How many of you had coffee or tea and you can still remember, wow, that coffee made me feel so good? We have to train the mind to be mindful by focusing on little things at a time. What are we mindful about right now? Are we mindful about how many times we pick up the phone and randomly look at it? Start counting those times. Be mindful of, so at the end of the day, you can tell me, I randomly picked up my phone even when it was not ringing. So you train the mind to pick up detail. When you have your lunch today, mindfully eat it, okay? Mindfully eat it. What are the flavors that you feel from the food? How does it feel in your mouth? Did you find out that you were fast eater today? How do you feel after your meal? Are you feeling heavy, sluggish? Do you feel that you're tired for the next session? These are little things that we start. What was the last conversation you had with your loved one or your child or your partner? Do you remember it? What are the three best things that your partner said to you in the last three days? Do you remember it? If you're mindful, you will because it struck a chord in your heart and you're mindful about it. Which is why sometimes more powerful than meditation is reflection. How many of you meditate at night before sleeping? Okay, what I want you to do today is don't meditate, reflect. How do you do reflection? From the time you woke up till the time you sleep, play the entire day in your mind. Don't judge it. Don't judge it. Play the entire day in your mind. Pick up every little detail. Reflection is also a powerful teacher. And then you realize, oh, I was so mindful, so non-mindful during my lunch. I was so non-mindful when that person was speaking to me. And that's how we learn from our day. Reflection is very, very powerful. If you're unhappy today, you just say, oh, I had a bad conversation with my wife or my husband or my partner. No. Go deeper into it. What about that conversation made you angry? That's teaching you mindfulness because you're reflecting on it. So reflection and mindfulness are directly connected with each other. Reflect on how the sunrise made you feel. Was it like, oh, wow, I got a fab picture for my Instagram today? Or was it beyond that? Was it beyond that? How, does, how did your breakfast make you feel today? Are you powered on energy, en energy from the carbs or excitement from the event? Be mindful about these little things. Be mindful about the time that you've spent. Be mindful about where your time is going. So it starts with little things. Everyone close your eyes right now and just be mindful about the sounds that you can hear. Pick up a sound and be with the sound. Simple, simple exercise. Just be with the sound. I hear the whirring of the air conditioner. 
and just keep focused on that sound. Now, if you hear a new sound, move the focus to the new sound, and don't go back to the old sound. Mindfulness. How many of you are wearing shoes? Now, become mindful. How do your toes fit in your shoes? Are they snug, tight, feeling warm? Become mindful about your toes. Become mindful about the last person you judged. How does it make you feel now? Think of the last person or event or thing that you judged. How do you feel? What feelings come out? Whether you're right or wrong is not the practice of mindfulness. We're not judging. We just want to know how we felt. Be mindful about something that hurt you in life now. Pick up something that hurt you in life. Be mindful about it. Not who's right, who's wrong. What are the feelings that come up? If any of you did a workout this morning, be mindful about how you felt. And are you still feeling the effects of the workout right now? Like you're feeling relaxed? Or was it just a tick in the box? I did my workout today. A workout, yoga done with mindfulness is way more effective than just doing it. That's why the beauty of yoga is coordinating the breath with movement. That's what works the magic of the asanas. Be mindful about the last thing that you were happy about. Person, thing, someone said something to you. And if you take time to think of it, that means we're not mindful. The things that make us happy should come instantly to our mind. Like, I know that cup of coffee with sunrise makes me happy. Oh, that little smile I got from my daughter this morning made me happy. It should come instantly because that means you're focusing on the things that are going well in your life. Oh, I'm sure the things that hurt you came up much, much quicker because you've been putting more energy and attention over there. And that's what you've got to change, the neural circuit. That's it. Open up your eyes. That's mindfulness. It's difficult. You'll practice it. You'll get good, and you'll fail again. And you'll fail again, and you'll fail again. But start. Start over and over again. Start with little things that make you mindful. And then apply it to your food, apply it to your exercise, apply it to your relationships, apply it to your personal growth. I'm sorry, who asked the question? Yeah, I hope you got your answer. It's practice, practice, practice. You want to get good at playing the piano? Practice. You want to get good at cooking? Practice. That's the simplicity of it. Practice, practice, practice. Right. I will take the lead on that and we'll wrap this up. Luke, I got to say this personally. The way you connected every single aspect of living and you gave us things like literally drinking through a fire hose. I am inspired and we'll do everything that we can to spread this message from the video that we recorded and every person here will, uh, all the, I'll take the things from your team, all your books, all your resources because I think this message needs to go out far and wide and such a pleasure to have you. I'm truly, truly inspired. Thank you so much for being here. It means a lot. And guys, please yeah. give them a bigger love. Huge, huge, huge round of applause, please. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you.